This is a short video on endemic fungal infections. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of endemic fungal infections largely centered around the United States. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes on the flowchart and talking about everything one by one as we repopulate the entire slide. Let's go ahead and get started. These endemic fungal infections typically start as pneumonia and create a disseminated systemic infection. We'll be talking about four of them. First, histoplasmosis, which is caused by the fungus Histoplasma capsulatum. Next, coccidiomycoses, which is caused by the fungi of the genus Coccidioides. This is also known as valley fever. Next, paracoccidiomycosis, which is caused by the fungus in the genus Paracoccidioides. And lastly, blastomycosis, which is caused by the fungus Blastomyces derbatididis. Let's start with the etiology for each of these, and they're all associated with a specific region, an endemic area. That's why they're called endemic fungal infections. So the first one, histoplasmosis, is associated with the Mississippi, with the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys. So that's this area of the United States. It really makes up a lot of east of the United States. So Mississippi and Ohio River valleys. These maps are all from the CDC, and they're all kind of nice. The, the bigger association with histoplasma, and this is one that you might see on test questions or on your board exams, is that the patient has been exposed to bird or bat droppings while doing an activity like spelunking or cave exploration. So that's where this fungus is found. And lastly, immunosuppression predisposes you to this fungus, <clears throat> and likely all the other fungi here as well. So that could be from AIDS, for instance. It could be from immunosuppressive medication, such as after an organ transplant perhaps, and it can also be a hereditary deficiency in the immune system. Next, let's discuss coccidiomycosis. This is associated with the southwestern United States and California areas. So this one you'll see is, um, it's called valley fever. I like to think of it more as like a desert disease, and we'll see that when we get to the symptoms. A lot of them are um, nicknamed something to do with the desert. In addition, this one is associated with soil and dust exposure, especially when soil and dust is like kicked up, uh, such as during a windstorm, an earthquake, or an archeological exploration. Next, paracoccidiomycosis. This one is associated with South and Central America, largely areas of Brazil. Unfortunately, I don't have a map from the CDC for this one. They did not have one. This one is interesting because it's much more prevalent in men than in women. And um, usually when we make this distinction, it's not such a huge difference. But in this case, there's a 15-fold difference between men and women. So men are much more likely to get paracoccidiomycosis. Lastly, blastomycosis. This one is associated with the southeastern United States, the central, the eastern United States, and the Great Lakes region of the U.S. So kind of similar distribution to histoplasma. It's largely the eastern part of the United States, but... Um, a little more spread out, a little more into Maine, and a little less into Florida. Now let's talk about the manifestations and symptoms for each of these. Going back to histoplasmosis, this is one of the few that can present asymptomatically. So you might not have symptoms at all in somebody who has histoplasmosis. It can also present with a flu-like illness. This includes fever, weight loss, erythema nodosum, hepatosplenomegaly, megaly, lymphadenopathy, and a non-productive cough. You can get these oral lesions that are ulcerative. They can be palatal or on the tongue. On chest x-ray, you'll notice diffuse nodular densities with focal infiltrates or cavities. You can also see your lymphadenopathy on chest x-ray as well. The best initial test, however, is not the chest x-ray. It's really urine and uh, serum polysaccharide antigen test. Then you'll do a confirmatory stain, and you'll be able to look at this under the microscope. So you'll either do a biopsy to get a sample of the, uh, of the, of the skin or of the, of the ulcers in the tongue, and you can also do a bronchoalveolar lavage to get a sample of the pneumonia. And then when you do a silver stain, you'll notice these macrophages filled with yeast cells. And we interestingly use red blood cells as like a, as like a measure, a size measure, to compare these, these fungus to. In this case, the histoplasmus fungus fungus is smaller than the red blood cells. The, the histoplasma fungus measures 1 to 5 microns, whereas red blood cells are about 10 microns in size. So really this silver stain of the biopsy or bronchioalveolar lavage is going to be your definitive test to identify macrophages filled with these yeast cells, with the histoplasma capsulatum cells. Next, coccidiomycosis. This one also presents with a flu-like illness uh, or pneumonia, slightly different. You'll have fever and cough still, but you'll also have night sweats. You can have anorexia, chest pain, and dyspnea. 
This one also affects many other organ systems as well. So it's possible to have central nervous system involvement with a meningitis, skin involvement again with erythema nodosum. In this case, it's called desert bumps. Remember, this one's associated with the desert. Your joint involvement can cause arthralgias. This is called desert rheumatism. Again, desert association. And this one affects the bones. You can have multiple osteolytic lesions. So that's something you might see on x-ray, or the patient might have bone pain, or maybe even lead to fractures. The chest x-ray here can be normal, but you can also see infiltrates. You can see lymphadenopathy. You can see pleural effusion. So it's not super helpful in this case. In this case, again, you want to do a stain and look at this under the microscope. So you'll get some sample of the fungus, either from the sputum, from the wound exudate, or from a joint effusion. And you can do a KOH, silver, or culture, and you'll see large spherules containing endospores. And in this case, the fungus itself, the coccidiotes genus, will be bigger than the red blood cells. So that's how you differentiate it from the histoplasma, which will be smaller from the red blood cells. Next, paracoccidiomycosis. This one can also be asymptomatic, but can, it can also present in many different ways across organ systems again. So this can cause painful nasal, pharyngeal, and laryngeal mucosal ulcerations. It can also cause lymphadenopathy. This time they're usually cervical lymphadenopathy. This one can also disseminate and cause extrapulmonary manifestations. It actually produces skin symptoms that are more commonly associated with blastomycosis. And that's why I've put it down here, and we'll talk about them more with blastomycosis. But essentially, the paroxoxidiomycosis and blastomycosis can both cause verrucous lesions and granulomatous nodules that look like squamous cell carcinoma. For paracoccidiomycosis, you again want to look at it under the microscope. In this case, you can do a smear of the KOH and calcofluor stain or a tissue biopsy with a silver or PAS stain. And in both or either, you'll see budding yeast with a captain's wheel formation. This one will also be larger than red blood cells. Lastly, blastomycosis can also cause a pneumonia-like presentation. You'll have cough, dyspnea, tachycardia, fever. We already mentioned the Characteristic skin symptoms, you can have verrucous lesions and granulomatous nodules that look like squamous cell carcinoma. You can also have bone osteolytic lesions, just like in coccidiomycosis, so osteolytic lesions in the ribs, vertebrae, and long bones, for instance. This can present as pain for the patient. You can also see this on chest x-ray, uh, and it might also lead to fractures. You can have genitourinary involvement, like prostatitis, orchitis, or epididymis. So the patient might have problems using the bathroom, they might have pain, they might have inflammation in the groin area. You can have central nervous system lesions again, so meningitis, <coughs> epidural, or intracranial abscesses. And lastly, when you look at this under the microscope, it's usually gonna be from sputum, urine, or body fluids. You first wanna do a KOH test to see if it's a fungus at all, then you'll do a confirmatory culture. When you do that confirmatory culture, the yeast form at temperatures, uh, body temperatures are warmer, will show up as broad-based buds. So that's a characteristic key term for blastomycosis, broad-based buds. And this time the size will be approximately equal to red blood cells. So this has been an overview of endemic fungal infections. I hope it was helpful and thank you for listening.